In this video, we're going to talk more about C macros, which are those things you've seen before where we have a hash defined followed by some definitions or some constants. So far, we've primarily used those for symbolic constants, and we'll see an example of that. However, there's a lot more capability there. So we'll take a look at some of the things you can do. Now, I will tell you as a word of warning before we start, there is some definite trouble that you can get yourself into with C macros. And in general, they tend to be found upon for most applications. However, there are some places where they give you a very nice balance between clear code and efficiency. So the first macro we'll see is the, the same thing we've seen before, where we have a pound defined, where we are defining some sort of symbolic constant. Here, we're defining the symbolic constant num to be 123. So in our code, if we use num, what happens is, is any occurrence of num outside of a string literal will get replaced with the characters one, two, three. Now this is almost like as if we have someone go in real fast and copy one, two, three in place of every instance of num in our code. The one exception again is the string literals don't get replaced. Now a more advanced type of macro would be something that simulates what a function does. Here, notice I have this piece of code that looks like a function invocation. And then I have some code where I say what that function needs to be. So in my code, if I increment x, then that will get replaced in the code with x plus 1. Not a plus 1, but x plus 1, because x is the parameter. If instead I said increment 3, then I would see 3 plus 1 in my code. So an even more advanced example would be this increment decrement function that checks to see is something less than 0. If it is, it subtracts 1 from it. Otherwise, it adds 1 to it. So we basically are increasing the absolute value with this little pseudo function. So if I call ink deck in my code, then that gets expanded to a check to see if x is less than zero. And if it is, we subtract one, otherwise we add one. Now the problem here becomes if I do something like ink deck x plus plus, here we're incrementing x, but remember, we're not just incrementing x in this case, Macros get handled by the preprocessor, which happens before the code executes. So this is a code replacement. This gets replaced with x minus minus, x plus plus less than zero. And then it says x plus plus minus one, x plus 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 one. So we're incrementing x during this check. And then we increment x again when we execute one of the two cases. So hopefully you can see where that's a potential problem. And that's something you have to keep in mind if you're using a macro function, then you need to make sure that you're just passing a single value in there so that you don't run into cases like this where you're doing code multiple times. And I encourage you to play around with this and just sort of see what sort of crazy things you can have happen in your code by passing it to a macro like this. So now let's see some code examples. So to start off with, we'll define a symbolic constant called max that we'll set to 10. And we've seen this before. And I also have a function I defined that calculates the absolute value of an integer. In my main method, I have three integers. And let me add one more. I'll say that that's four times three. I'll also space some of these out to make it a little easier to read. So now that I have these three integers, I can print those out. And then my program will exit. So let's compile the source code and run it. And you can see that it prints out the values that you would expect for those integers. Now there's a GCC flag dash capital E that'll actually pre-process our code, but not compile it. So if I do that, I get a bunch of junk because it's pulling in this header file. But notice everywhere I use max in my source code, the characters max gets replaced with 10 by the preprocessor. So max doesn't actually appear in this code only the value that max is defined as. Now the preprocessor has some more capabilities and I can actually define some things that look a lot like functions using the preprocessor. So if I define triple, so notice this looks like a function declaration and there's a parameter and then I can say a times three. So now anywhere it sees triple a, it'll replace that with a times three. However, a is a parameter, so it'll actually replace this a with whatever the parameter is. So let me change this to triple three. So notice this looks just like a function call, 
And if I hover over in VS Code, you can see that it tells me that that expands to three times three. And just to make that distinctive and to have it match what we did before, I'll make that triple four. So you can see that that'll expand to th four times three. So let me run the preprocessor again. And notice all of this defined stuff is gone. All the comments are gone because the comments don't affect the compilation and these preprocessor macros get replaced before compilation. So you can see here, max is replaced by 10 and triple four is replaced by four times three. Four is our parameter. So A gets replaced with four and then triple four gets replaced with four times three. So let's compile and run this. And you can see we get the same result we had before. So let's run our absolute value function and see how that works. And we'll say absolute value of, let's do J first, and then let's do K next. And I need to add those parameters. And let's see what that gives us. Okay, and just as you would expect the absolute value of 10 and negative 10, those are both 10. Now notice, if I print everything out again, you'll notice those functions don't change the values, and that's good. We wouldn't want that to happen. So now let's take this function and replace it with a macro. So I'm going to define, and I'll call this ABSM to stand for absolute value macro, and it's going to also take a single parameter, and I'm going to check is A less than zero, and I'll use the ternary operator, so I'll say if it is, then I'm going to return negative A. Otherwise, I'll return A. And you may wonder why I have all these parentheses. You may think maybe that's unnecessary. And the reason is, is this is going to do a substitution with whatever is here. And so sometimes it's hard to know for sure what's going on and what sort of syntax is in this code. And so by putting A's in parentheses when it could potentially be ambiguous just makes things a little simpler and less error prone. And again, using macros is a bit controversial. Some people say never use them. In general, though, for any feature of the language, it's important to know how they work and then understand when's best to use them, when not to use them. Just because it's in the language doesn't mean you have to use them, but there are cases where this can be helpful. And the downside of doing something like this is since this works at the preprocessor level, not the compiler level, you can introduce some pretty nasty bugs if you're not careful. And in fact, we'll show an example of that in a few moments. So now, Let's do the same thing we did with absolute value F, except now we'll call absolute value M. And the advantage we get here is notice this is not going to be a function call anymore. Let's run the preprocessor first. And you can see here we're making a function call. Here we're replacing some code. And so let me add a couple of lines here of output just to indicate what's going on, just so we don't lose track. Okay, that should cover it. It looks like we're ready to test this. So let's run. Actually, we just ran the preprocessor again. But again, notice here we're making a function call, here we're not. So we don't have the overhead of making that actual function call. So let's take off the dash E parameter and let's run. And you can see that it gives us the same result that we had before, which is what we would expect. And let me add a line of output here to give some space. So now let's try something a little bit different. And I'm going to copy all of these function calls. But now, instead of J, I'm going to call it with J++. And I'll do the same thing here. Actually, I don't want to do that here because I don't want those to change. So let me add plus plus here so that we get it in the output. But of course, we don't want to call J++ here because it'll increment and then it'll increment. That's not what we want. OK, so here you can see we're going to call the same functions we did before, but now we're going to pass J++. And you'll notice we get some warnings here, but no error. So let me just run this and see what happens. So here, notice the result. Now, this may seem a little weird to you because this says 11 plus plus, this says negative 9 plus plus, but then when you look at the absolute values, it's 10 in both cases. The reason for this is when you say plus plus, this expression evaluates to the original value of J then it increments j. So let's change this to a prefix, because then we're going to get a little better result. 
And by making that a prefix, what's going on is now I'm saying that I want to increment and then return the incremented value as a result of the expression. So now let's compile and run. This should look a little bit better. The absolute value of 11 is 11, negative 9 is negative 9, and notice j is 11, k is negative 9. And of course, m and n, we haven't messed with it all here. But notice when we use the macro, first off, we didn't actually do that twice. So let's fix that. So ignore these first two plus symbols. Now notice here, j was 11, but here it says 13, and this is 7. So from this step to this step, j incremented by 1. From this step to this step, j incremented by 2. And if you want to see why that is, let's run the preprocessor. Now notice I'm incrementing j here when I do the check. And then based on the result, I'm incrementing j again. So I actually increment j twice. That's almost for sure not what I'm thinking here when I increment j. I probably just want to increment j once and then check that absolute value. And so this is something you have to be aware of. Whatever this parameter is, is going to show up three times everywhere that A appears in my original definition. So just something to keep in mind with macros. That's one of the things that can get you in trouble. So again, I'm not going to say that you should never use them. There are cases where they're helpful, but you should always make sure that when you're using them, that you're using them in the correct way possible, that you're aware of what some of the pitfalls are so that you can avoid those. And C and C++ also now both have capabilities to inline functions, which is just a way of telling the compiler that you can take this function and in assembly code basically do this idea here where you're expanding it out. But again, it's a little safer in this case because you're not doing the essentially the code copy and paste into the definition like you do with a macro. So that's a quick introduction to macros and function calls. And we'll actually see some more examples of using the preprocessor in a later video.